Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, Ben. Thank you for the introduction and thanks to all of you for your uh, interest and for taking time today to uh, to listen to what I have to say about this uh, recently completed or just wrapping up project, uh, a review of past efforts to model uh, regeneration in the mixed woods in Alberta and the potential for developing a new mixed wood regeneration model. So I'll make sure my video is turned off to save a little bandwidth and I'll just uh, leap into the presentation here. And then I'll make the slides go forward first. Okay, so a few acknowledgements before I get started. Uh, this review was completed uh, largely prior to my assuming my new position at the University of Alberta when I was working as an independent forestry consultant. But I'm fortunate that in the last few months since I've arrived at the University of Alberta, I've had some time to gain some additional perspective on the mixed wood forest type and on some historic research problems, uh, projects across the province through the tours that I did with Brian to various forest companies and meet with government uh, in the forest. And so I've been able to weave a little bit of that into this project. Uh, funding for this project was provided by the Mixed Wood Project team of FGRO. And I wanna uh, to share a few special thanks to Dick Dempster, to Kat Froze, and to Brian Roth, who provided some important feedback and conversations, ideas, and some proofreading that really improved the report and, uh, and the work that I've uh, done today. So thanks to those folks uh, as well. So uh, first we'll start with a little bit of introduction uh, in terms of reference for the project and some background information. So the terms of reference provided to me by the Mixedwood Project team in FGRO is that they have an interest in developing a mixed wood regeneration model that can be used for not you know, these five uh, needs, but also uh, not excluding others in addition to these five needs. So they include developing and comparing reforestation strategies uh, to meet yield objectives, maybe defining or refining functional grouping of stand or site types for reforestation, selecting planting densities or tending treatments for different groups, identifying those stand and site types that have a high risk of regeneration failure, and on educating planners and silviculturists uh, for improved linkage between silviculture and yield planning. And finally, the products that I was asked to generate as part of this project were, were two primary components, a literature review and an assessment of modeling approaches. So I wanna start with a little modeling 101. I like to take uh, the whole class of forest modeling efforts and divide them into three groupings based on purposes for the models. Some forest models have been developed purely for research purposes. When models are developed for research purposes, you know, essentially the, the, any forest model is a simplification of the real world. And as such, it's basically a set of, of scientific hypotheses about how the world, world, world functions. So when we build and test models, uh, the underlying hypotheses themselves are tested, they're f formalized and constructed, and they can help grow our scientific knowledge base about systems. And models that are used for research are quite different often from models that are used for projection. Projection uses are principally those in operational forestry where you wanna update inventories to the present or generate projections into the future of current inventory conditions. The third category I like to call gaming. Gaming is literally, in, in my mind, using models to explore alternatives based on the variables that can be selected, adjusted, tweaked, or tuned forward in generating predictions to see what the outcomes might be. And it's a little different from projection because we're not just trying to ask what's the best average prediction conditional on the current state, but how might that prediction change if we were to change our silviculture or look at the effect of region, for example. And so I'm talking about the potential to develop a regeneration model, but it's important to note Alberta already has a regeneration model. Uh, Dick Dempster presented back in March on the FRIPSI model, and you can go to the uh, FGRO website and look for the recordings of the spring webinar series. I've got a little link here on this slide, but it's easy to find with Google. And uh, that model is, uh, Dick gave a really great introduction to what was really a substantial and long-term effort in the pine forest type in Alberta. And on the right, I've got a little screenshot from the outputs from the FRIPSI model that Dick has produced. So I'm not blazing a trail even in Alberta here with this review. There's been a, a substantial amount of work that's been already done. 
And I'm going to borrow a little bit from what Dick said in that presentation, and I'd be happy to suggest you go back and, and listen to his words again, as he can say it much more eloquently than I can. But Dick gave some examples of some reasons why linking reforestation to growth and yield is important in Alberta. On my tours through Alberta with Brian Roth over the last few months, clearly cost exists as a, or you know, stands out as a big option. It's very expensive to invest in silviculture and reforestation and constraints on the, the tools that are available to foresters might only increase the cost. So understanding how those link to, link to uh, yield and stand development are very important. Uh, Dick mentioned allowable cut effect and that effectively effect, uh, you know, effective regeneration is the link towards improving stand yields over natural stands. So understanding that linkage is essential if that effect is to be realized. Uh, the, in Alberta, there is a legal and policy requirement for managing timber that is tied very closely to reforestation. And that implies that this is a significant amount of attention to reforestation and how those linkages are, are made towards yield. Uh, oftentimes, reforestation is described as a liability because until that liability is met, the burden still uh, lays on the forest uh, industry to carry out treatments. And once the reforestation liability is released, then that returns back to the government and their, that liability is gone. And businesses are always concerned about minimizing the liability. And to do that is not just to get rid of it, but to make sure that they're effective in meeting their obligations. And then it's automatically released. Dick made a lot of, uh, or spent some time emphasizing the, the, the limits of exposure to adverse scrutiny. And the very simple fact is that the, in Alberta, we're dealing with public forests and public interest in forests that uh, are often subject to adverse scrutiny. And the ability to demonstrate effectively the linkage between the activities that are going on on the ground in reforestation and long-term stand development uh, helps ensure that when people ask questions about the real sustainability of forestry on the ground, there are you know, examples and tools that can be used to demonstrate the, or defend the practices as they're, ha as they're happening today. So this is a really important area. And again, Dick can say it more eloquently, but I think it's important to reiterate it here. I borrowed again from Dick Dempster to illustrate a kind of a conceptual model of rotation phases in Alberta that I've used now since I found it in, in the EPH project and in others. But effectively in Alberta, when we're talking about post-harvest stands, we can uh, divide a rotation into two components, the re reforestation phase and the growth phase. It's very common in Alberta for post-harvest stands to, to represent the growth phase in models like the gypsy model or the MGM model. But the reforestation phase is not represented in models. Instead, and indicated here on the bottom left with establishment and performance surveys, usually regeneration is information is gathered on the ground through surveys. And those surveys are done through the reforestation standard of Alberta survey process, but they provide the inputs that are then fed to a performance linked uh, forecast through the growth model. A question that arises is, is it possible to model that reforestation phase to better understand and address the key questions that were outlined in the terms of reference for this project? <clears throat> Again, borrowing from Dick Dempster, there are some really important differences between di stand dynamics in the regeneration and the growth phases. Some examples in the growth phase, we tend to deal with what we call trees, or I'm gonna call overstory or maybe merchantable trees. But in regeneration, we're dealing with small trees, seedlings and saplings, the development of which is much less certain, in part because we don't even know if they're going to be there yet. And so forecasting that is a fundamental part of regeneration modeling. We're dealing with small trees, short trees. In the reforestation or regeneration phase, densities are increasing through additional ingrowth as regeneration proceeds. While in the growth phase, the primary effective density is decreases. Generally, when we think about the adequacy or a metric of how well stocked a stand is in the regeneration phase, we use stocking percentages, like the percent of, of regeneration plots that have at least one uh, appropriate tree. And in the growth phase, we take other metrics like basal area. In the regeneration phase, we've got long open crowns, and there are multiple factors that affect individual tree mortality. Management is very active during the regeneration phase, and ultimately, Dick suggests that the knowledge base is very poor during the regeneration phase, 
in contrast, it's actually quite good during the growth phase. I'm not sure I agree it's is as perhaps as sharp a difference as is given there. It's more that the dynamics within the regeneration phase are much more stochastic. And when I teach modeling, I like to point out that once you have a tree that's alive, it, you, you already know one of the most important things about generating a growth forecast. It's If it's alive and it's present, it's going to grow. In the regeneration modeling, we don't know if they're there yet. And if they are there, we don't know how fast they're going to grow because of the interacting effects of competing vegetation, which diminish as you enter into the growth phase. So there are some particular challenges during the re regeneration phase that have to be addressed for modeling. Before I proceed, I want to touch on just a few definitions. These are important because regeneration modeling is kind of thrown around as a, as a term that captures um, many different dynamics. And in the modeling literature, there's a distinction made between seeding processes and other processes. So seeding is the set of processes or dynamics that include flowering, pollination, seed uh, production, dispersal, and germination. And there are models that exist of all those processes. Uh, the end state of a seeding phase is the existence of live germinants, which some people call regeneration. In the literature, uh, the term regeneration is used more commonly to refer to the entire growth and development phase of germinants into seedlings and eventually saplings or small trees. So the end state of a regeneration model is usually trees that are passed to a main model. Uh, recruitment is sometimes used to describe regeneration, but recruitment is more commonly defined as the process of recognizing when trees reach a threshold size, which can be based in some models on height or diameter. So some other common terms used for recruitment are ingrowth or ingress. But a key feature of regeneration models ultimately is to model the appearance of, the spontaneous appearance of, we know it's not spontaneous, right? But for modeling purposes, the appearance of new trees. And new trees are usually those trees that have been too small to be considered otherwise. And so they're small or they're regeneration size. Now I was cautioned in some review of, or some discussions on this project of using the word tree because there's such an implicit uh, assumption in Alberta that trees are those that exceed some diameter threshold like nine centimeters and that really you've got seedlings, saplings and trees in forests. But I'm just gonna use the term tree to define uh, more generally to indicate the class of plants that form upright woody stems with trunk and branches. That's a horribly generic definition, but you know, a little seedling is a kind of tree. And our goal here in regeneration modeling is to regenerate seedling sized trees, to simulate seedling sized trees so they can be passed to a main model, which will simulate them as overstory sized trees. So in the first part of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about uh, the results from a literature review. This literature review was uh, focused globally. I looked at literature throughout the, or anywhere in the globe on past efforts to model forest regeneration. Looking through the global literature, I conclude that there are effectively three kinds of regeneration models. There are those that use component equations, those that use a technique called imputation, and those that might be described as mechanistic. And I'm gonna get into these three kinds of models in just a little bit more detail. I'm gonna try very hard not to overwhelm you with technical information. But I think it's important to understand the strengths and weaknesses of these different approaches. So component equations essentially model component dynamics of regeneration using equations. And I've decided to divide these component dynamics into three categories. The presence of trees, the abundance of trees, and attributes of trees. And here I've just used the word trees, so what I mean is regeneration sized trees. So presence of trees is often thought of in terms of the concept of stocking. And so here I have a lovely mixed wood forest with aspen and spruce, haha, -ha, with some great images that I could find online, and some hypothetical plots. And the concept of stocking should be pretty intuitive. Two out of these three plots are stocked with at least one tree uh, of a species of, of any species, but only uh, one of these plots is stocked with an aspen, and two of these plots are stocked with spruce. So one of the most difficult attributes or components of regeneration modeling. And when I say difficult, I mean a ability to do it really well, accurately, unbiased, but also precisely, 
is to predict stocking because regeneration in the absence of planting, but even perhaps with planting because planters don't always plant in a perfect grid, is a highly stochastic or random process. Stocking models are typically constructed in the literature using a technique called logistic regression. And here's just an example of a logistic regression model. You don't need to know much about the statistics here to understand what's going on in the graphic on the right. On the x-axis, we have time since disturbance. And on the y-axis, we have the probability of stocking. Of course, in reality, plots are either stocked, meaning they have a tree, or they're unstocked, non-stocked, which means they have no trees at all. So all those dots would represent hypothetical observations. But you can see that as time since disturbance increases, you're more likely to go from an unstocked situation to a stocked situation. So the probability of stocking increases. And so what logistic regression does is allows us to estimate a switching function, this sigmoid here, that describes the average probability of encountering a stock plot as you move across the X dimension. And I've shown an example of a stocked, stocking logistic regression model from a paper by Adem et al from 2010. This is just a logistic regression model. You can see the little a naught, a1 and a2 are regression coefficients. And dg and hm, those are predictor variables. So the way we build regeneration models for stocking is to fit logistic regressions and use observations of predictor variables to improve the quality of fit. Here, dg is a diameter measurement and hm is a height measurement. That's an example of a logistic model and virtually all papers in the literature that develop models of presence uh, or stocking use logistic regression. Remember the second component of these component models are models of abundance. Abundance is the number of trees that you find conditional on there being at least one. Note the difference in abundance and stocking. Stocking is just, is there at least a tree? Abundance is now you know there is at least a tree, how many are there? So you could also call density as an example. And two methods have been used to model density conditional on stocking being present. One is linear regression again, and two is modeling frequency distributions using probability densities. So how does this work? Well, here's an example of regression models. They're really very common in the literature. On the top left here, I have one from Adams and Eck. And Adams and Eck, again, we're talking about regeneration, but the exact way that regeneration is defined depends on the, the, con, uh, the, the preference of the model. Adams and Eck called it ingrowth. In this case, ingrowth was small trees that are appearing over a five-year period into the smallest diameter class tracked by their model. And they used regression and found ingrowth or ingress to be a simple function of quadratic, well, not simple, I guess it's an exponential, it's a nonlinear function of quadratic mean diameter. And this model was fit for tolerant mixed hardwood stands in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. This the second model down here by Green and Johnson was fit for post-fire uh, boreal mixed wood stands in Saskatchewan and Alberta. And in this case, this FDT is just the number of germinants that happen in a model or in, in in of Aspen post-fire. It looks like a complex function. It's a nonlinear multiplied function, 11,600 times BD, which is basal area of Aspen prior to disturbance. And T is time or years since disturbance. So this model captures the, the essentially the mortality trend through time as a function of the initial number of trees, which is 11,600 times this power of basal area and a uh, an exponential, declining exponential function of time, just fit using nonlinear regression. Another example here is on the right. These are from Yang and Huang's paper from 2015 and present ingrowth models for four major species groups in Alberta. Each of these are fit using, they're actually log linear functions when you, when you take a log of them on both sides. But when you back transform them, they look like this, but they pr provide ingrowth estimates uh, oh my gosh, now I can't remember what the time horizon was. I think it was five years. But each of these is made a function of various predictor variables. Uh, here, ingrowth is defined as trees exceeding a nine centimeter diameter threshold. And you can see BA for basal area, PA, PS, which is percent stocking of that species in the overstory. QMD is quadratic mean diameter in the overstory. 
and so forth. Another approach that's fairly common in estimating regeneration abundance are probability density models. So without getting too deep into probability modeling, I just got an example on the left of a hypothetical inventory where we just pulled out all of the plots that were stocked. And you can see that most of them have just one tree, a few of them have two trees, and very uncommonly, there's a large number of trees. So if we had an inventory for a very large stand, you might be able to describe the frequency distribution of uh, the number of trees per plot using this histogram on the right. Again, you can see there are a lot of plots with very small numbers of trees and a small number of plots that have very large numbers of trees. So that's pretty easy. We do this all the time compiling inventory data. Well, what probability models do is they fit a probability density function. In this case, the common one is the Weibull function to these distributions of, of stock plot data and then divide the stock plot data by important driving variables. So on the left here, I'm showing maybe a Weibull model fit to this distribution, which is for dry sites. And on the lower part, maybe a Weibull distribution fit to the distribution of trees on music sites. So then the parameters of the Weibull distribution are made models of predictor functions of predictor variables. So on the right, you can see an example of the regeneration density uh, model by Ferguson and Carlson from 1993 where trees per stock plot is a function, is this function up in the top, where B is a linear function of this cosine of aspect times slope, sine aspect slope, elevation, these SQREGT has is years since disturbance and AB's Grandis series are some habitat essentially um, ecocytes and the C model has elevation and some other disturbance metrics. So the number of trees per stock plot or tree density is made a function of environmental variables and silviculture variables if, if appropriate. And then predictions are generated by generating what is called the pseudorandom uh, number from the distribution. And this way it's done by using a pseudorandom number in the interval zero one. And for details on exactly how this works, you can contact me offline or dig into it. But fundamentally, we take a probability model, make it a function of the explanatory variables and use that to generate predictions of abundance. We have to combine presence and abundance to come up with some estimate of the actual regeneration in a plot or a stand of interest. And this can be done two ways, deterministically, usually it's done at the stand level, or stochastically, usually done at the plot level. What we mean here by deterministic and stochastic is, if you have a probability of stocking generated from your logistic regression, and you estimate trees per stock plot from your linear regression, you just multiply one by two to estimate the total amount of regeneration occurring in your stand. So if the probability of stocking is 0.8 and you've got 100 trees per stock plot, then that's 80 trees per acre or per hectare that you'd expect as your estimate of regeneration for that stand. Stochastic models are usually done when regeneration is simulated at the plot level. You generate a probability of stocking and then generate a pseudo-random number on the interval zero to one. If the random number is less than the probability of stocking, then we assume there's presence is zero, meaning no trees. But if the random number is greater than or equal to the probability of stocking, then presence is not zero, and we just straight estimate the number of trees per stock plot. And both of these methods can be shown to generate unbiased estimates of regeneration, but some models like estimates at the plot level and other models operate at the stand level. You can do it both ways for the stand level too, by the way. Now, the third class of what I might call component models are those that are advanced probability models. These actually combine advanced probability systems together into single models. And here's just an example by uh, Lee et al. from 2011. This was done for the Acadian region of North America. So it included uh, New Brunswick and Maine and Nova Scotia. And they used a, a series of advanced probability models, uh, the zero inflated Poisson model, a zero altered Poisson. It's not the exact ones don't really matter. I'm calling these two-stage combined models because what they do effectively is model both presence and abundance at the same time. Whoops. So what you can see in the uh, these four graphics are comparisons of observed 
distributions of stock plots, and that's overlain by mo different fit models. So see at the very top left there, there's 10,000 stems per hectare of in the zero class. These are these data are zero inflated. Actually, it's not 10,000, it's 10,000 plots, right? There's, there's 10,000 plots that had absolutely no in-growth trees at all. And then the rest of the data, it's not, it's between what well, we get one and 90 trees, but there's no more than about two or 3,000 plots that fall into those categories. And most of them are small numbers of plots. So when they fit a Poisson model, and it doesn't really matter, but Poisson models are commonly used to model count data. That clearly fits really poorly because the data are zero inflated. But if you look at the other three graphics, you can see that the zero inflated Poisson model with the random effect in the top right, zero inflated uh, or negative binomial model in the bottom left, and the zero inflated negative binomial on the very bottom right, all do much better at modeling all that zero inflation. So I'm calling these two stage combined because once you have this probability model fit, just like with the Weibull model, you can generate a simulation by drawing a pseudo random number and back solving the equation for the estimated number of trees per plot. Well, this all sounds like, Robert, this is complicated. It is, I don't know how to fit these. I have to dig into the literature to figure it out. But my review of the literature showed these have been really popular in the last few years, but I'm not really sure what the benefit is because they combine the two steps, but they're really complicated to fit and I, don't, I was unable to find any larger regeneration model frameworks that incorporated these advanced probability models. So I'm reluctant to conclude anything beyond these are really cool methods that are exciting some forest biometricians who, have, who will soon demonstrate their relevance in operational regeneration model development. The last class of models are those that pre predict tree attributes like tree species or their class like advanced regeneration or seed regeneration, and those that predict tree attributes like tree diameter or tree height. Once you've predicted the presence or absence of trees, the abundance of trees, then before you can pass those to a main model, you have to define their species and their key attributes. Now, different modelers have used different approaches to, to, to uh, generate predictions of species. Some predict total regeneration and then predict which fraction will be each individual species. And as I showed in a previous example, Yang and Huang's model simply predicted the abundance by species directly. When it comes to predicting diameter or height, it's very common to use these probability density models because you can fit a, a density function to an empirical distribution of diameters of small trees and make it functions of site attributes or site index. And so that approach is used. And some models, when they uh, focus on planted regeneration, skip straight to the estimation of attributes. Okay, so the first kind of models were component models. The second set are imputation models. What imputation models do, and they're much simpler than, uh, in, at least conceptually, if not in implementation, than component models. Imputation models effectively try to find a match between a target for a regeneration prediction and available field data. And so I've conveniently chosen uh, the master's thesis by Kat Froze here as an example of an imputation model, but it's a very good example because that's what it was. In this imputation model, which was fit for uh, Southeastern British Columbia for dry Douglas fir, the effect is to search through the space of sampled stands where you have some measurement of years since disturbance and, and a count of the plots that are available and then try to divide these up into strata. So here, CAT divided these into years, strata defined by, or combinations defined by years since disturbance, moisture class, basal area class, and the presence of planted or the, the, st the known status of planted trees. So you end up with kind of a hypercube of combinations. And this table one on the left shows the number of plots that she had from her field data that fit into each of these classes. And the way you define the classes is hopefully a method that maximizes the ability to discriminate between the amount of regeneration found on the ground. An example then is once you, if you wanna use these models for prediction, you match your target where you want the prediction to the best plot in the data. And you simply take the, the estimates of regeneration from the data 
and you impute those to the target. So here, this moisture class mesic, in years disturbance class two, age 10 to 14, basal area class open, these are the results of the averages of those 14 plots for the various regeneration densities by height class. And that's your regeneration model. Obviously, imputation models are straightforward in the sense that you just collect a bunch of data from plots on the ground, divvy it all up in some method that works for you, and then use it. But there's some advanced techniques to improve the ways we find matches that improve their accuracy. Uh, but ultimately, imputation models are constrained by the uh, range of conditions that are found in the calibration or the, the field data used to build them. Another class of models, or the final third and final class that I'm going to talk about, are mechanistic models. And one example I'll use for you is sortie because it has some application in uh, in northern British Columbia and Alberta in the past. And this there's a paper published by Ribbons et al. on the regeneration model that's included in sortie. It's a pretty steep paper, but the bottom line is the equation off on the right is the regeneration equation for sortie, where p is the number of trees you'd expect to find in a one meter grid cell for a projection interval. And that estimate is, STR stands for a standard regeneration number that's modified by the size of an adjacent tree. So dBH is in there and this one over N times E to the minus dm. M here is the distance in meters from the grid cell to the individual tree. And you're like, grid cell, what's a grid cell? Well, the sortie model is completely spatial. And to generate a simulation, you have to know the X, Y, Z coordinates of every tree. And the simulation plot is divided into a grid of one meter square cells. And you generate, you populate that with your measured stand. And then when you press go and simulate the model forward, it generates actual numbers of regeneration in each cells, each cell and produces individual little trees, kills them off and so forth. I think you can see the limitation of mechanistic models, why they're fantastic for research but not very useful for uh, operational applications. Here's an example of the output from that rec uh, recruitment model or regeneration model from Sortie. These are all different uh, species of uh, conifer from the Northeastern forest region, like red maple, sugar maple, white pine, red oak, white oak, and so forth. And so you get these really sophisticated curves, um, but the model's practically impossible to use or to calibrate. So briefly, I'm gonna summarize the history that I found of regeneration modeling in Alberta, because there is one and uh, it's very interesting and it informs the development of new models uh, or the potential for developing new models going forward. So uh, Yang Okin in 1998 uh, did a master's thesis at the University of Alberta and developed uh, models for presence and abundance, so essentially component models, using two different threshold diameters, so one and nine centimeters, and uh, provincial government PSP data in Alberta. As far as I can tell, this wasn't published in the peer-reviewed literature, and Yang and Huang's paper in 2015 mentioned that these were incorporated into an early version of the MGM model. Of course, Yang and Huang in 2015 developed their own models for um, regeneration presence and abundance. And they suggest in the paper that Ken's model in 1998 uh, were not very useful. So presumably new models were developed to replace those. And these were for ingrowth of trees at a nine centimeter diameter uh, threshold calibrated using uh, government PSP data. There's a lot of information in this paper on the nature of the data, like were they constrained to post-harvest PSPs uh, or certain site conditions? And it's not clear what happened with these models, whether they were ever implemented anywhere in a growth and yield framework. Uh, the MGM model has a treeless generator, which is effectively a, a component regeneration model. The treeless generator uses a bivariate Weibull distribution. So it's a, a complication of the methods I described earlier to generate predictions of diameter and height for, for user supplied estimates of regeneration of abundance. So the user has to know how many trees per hectare there are. And in fact, to use the model, you also need summary statistics on the mean maximum standard deviation of height diameter and site quality and some other predictors uh, to make a target regeneration forecast. These are clearly easier to obtain or estimate than it is to necessarily collect individual tree data on regeneration to initialize the model. 
And as I understand it, this is currently implemented in MGM as released and available uh, from uh, the, um, the West Bogey developers. Of course, it's important to note again, the Fripsy model from 2021, fresh off the presses pretty soon, I managed to get a copy of the draft a user guide from Dick Dempster. Uh, this model was released uh, so far this year, and I encourage you to go back and look at Dick's presentation, but the model estimates, uh, generates estimates of presence and abundance of regeneration using mixtures of logistic and uh, linear regression qu equations for presence and for abundance, uh, predominantly of pine, but also some associated species. Okay, that's the results of the literature review. Now I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about my assessment of regeneration modeling approaches and touch on a few key issues and opportunities uh, in Alberta. So the literature review revealed that there are a few operational scale models that include regeneration subroutines. Probably the most dominant one, I would think almost globally, is the prognosis regeneration model, also known as the forest vegetation simulator. The regeneration model for prognosis was published by Ferguson and Carlson in 1993. And this model is still exists today. You can go and download a copy from their website. I talked to the developers. They're currently calibrating a version of the regeneration model for Alaska, coastal Alaska, but for the moment, it's only calibrated for Northern Idaho and Western Montana. There's been interest in developing variants for other geographic regions in the United States. The model is, like I say, it's continuously maintained, and so you can go and get it today. Uh, the POTATA model also has a linked uh, regeneration subroutine. POTATA is a model developed by the University of uh, Virginia Techno Tech University for Pinus Tata, Lavalali Pine. And this model, the regeneration model developed by Westfall, is actually not a complete regeneration model and that expects the users to provide estimates of the number of planted trees, but it develops comprehensive attribute estimates and survival estimates for planted trees using uh, silviculture variables like fertilization, uh, site preparation, and uh, vegetation control. And so I've included it here because it continu continues to be maintained and embedded in an existing model framework. I found another model called T. This is so cool, I had to put T in quotes here. Imagine naming your model T. These people must have found out about the R software environment, thought they'd go the same way. I talked to Professor Gabakin by email, and this model was published in 2008, but it's fallen out of maintenance. But it does exist as a comprehensive framework, and uh, it's really quite interesting, um, though there's very little information on how well it functions. Of course, I've mentioned sortie already, so I won't uh, mention it or review it again here. And again, I've got to mention Fripsy because it's an operational scale model because it links the regeneration model to the existing Gypsy model. So you can go all the way from simulating regeneration to whole stand yield. So at this point in the project, I was asking myself, why are there so few regeneration models? I, mean, I only found those four, so a few more possibly in Europe that have got some lines on information. Well, here's a potential, some reasons, and it's important to keep these in mind especially as, you, as we contemplate a, an additional re regeneration modeling effort in Alberta. So regeneration modeling is unrewarding. And I say unrewarding in the sense that it's hard to fit models or to develop models that are really accurate because regeneration is so stochastic. And since mostly in the modeling literature they've been focusing on yield of mature stands, it's not clear that those models get a tremendous amount of use. And so for the model developers and the model users, it's potentially unrewarding. And so if something's unrewarding, you just don't do it so often. Uh, regeneration modeling is also really hard. It's hard to get all of the data that you need to do a good job. I think possibly productive forest types around the world, uh, especially the higher productivity sites, tend to have a higher emphasis on plantation management and then plantations. You automatically cover the biggest question in regeneration modeling, which is presence. So it kind of reduces the need for operational scale modeling. And finally, the necessary data to develop regeneration models are often rare or they're expensive to collect. So the data collection effort for prognosis was a, a 10 year effort uh, that spanned all of uh, Idaho and Western Montana. It took two different scientists on, on two, three different programs to get it all, and they haven't been able to do it since because of the expense involved in collecting the data. So this explains, I think, why there are perhaps few models. 
Another observation from the review is that uh, the optimal structure for models is really actually not clear. I've got a little timeline here kind of showing roughly how these models appear to have been, been popularized in the literature through time. Pure single stage models started in the 70s but fell out of favor in the 80s. And I think this is in part because computers came along and regression became possible to do in computers in the 60s and 70s. But then pure single stage models, which generate abundance estimates directly, are they kind of assume you've always got regeneration and that's not always the case. So two-stage models came about starting in the 1980s, like the prognosis model. Two-stage models generate predictions of presence and then abundance. And they're currently an area of active research. There are recent models like the Fripsy model effectively that have been released recently. These mixture models, these fancy advanced statistical models kind of started to gain and become in vogue in the literature in the late 2000s. I think because of even more enhanced computer power, maybe it's brain power, but also um, uh, just interest within the biometrics community. The Sorti model was used and developed aggressively in the 90s. There were some efforts in BC to try to link it to the prognosis BC model, but this petered out sometime in the 2000s. I left a little arrow in here because Sorti continues to be used, but mostly by ecologists doing process or research-based studies. And imputation approaches were really popular in the late 90s and early 2000s, but again, they seem to have fallen out of favor I've left a little bit bigger arrow because imputation, imputation, imputation is still a really popular method for enhanced forest inventory. And if you can generate spatially continuous advanced forest inventories, maybe you don't need to model regeneration at all. You just predict a tree list for every pixel and you drove, drive those pixels forward. So I've left a little bit bigger arrow to indicate that. But the question about what optimal structure exists for linked regeneration growth and yield models is completely unanswered in the literature. I think it's overdue and it's timely and there's a great opportunity to, to tackle that in, the, in more detail. Some things to consider about regeneration models include which driving variables are important or even possible to include in a regeneration model. There's trade-offs between complexity, model utility, and opportunity in every model development effort. So a lot of papers on regeneration models include metrics of current stand condition, like uh, how much basal area you have right now. And it's perhaps more relevant in, in situations where partial harvesting is used because partial harvesting relates to uh, the amount of space available for new regeneration. Lots of, many models also include metrics of predisturbance stand structure. So cone density, or basal area of aspen are well shown well to be related to regeneration densities. And so if available, these would be very effective tools for improving the accuracy of regeneration models. Many models use site index or some other productivity metric. Uh, indicator variables used for ecocytes or soils that allow the models to be subdivided into, into strata or classes. Many models use climate variables or proxies for climate like uh, um, Ferguson and Crookston's model, which uses this cosine of aspect times slope and sine of aspect times slope to find optimum site positions. A silviculture obviously is important and, and uh, Ferguson and Crookston's model has indicator variables for various silviculture treatments, including site preparation. And a number of recent models have incorporated metrics of browse potential into uh, regeneration forecasts. When thinking about the design of a regeneration model, it's also important to consider the time dimension. And by time dimension, I mean different kinds of regeneration happen differently with respect to different kinds of times since disturbances. So planted trees are one kind. You don't have to predict whether they're going to be there, but you do have to predict whether they're going to survive. Natural regeneration sometimes occurs rapidly after disturbance, and that's different from natural regeneration that occurs slowly after slow disturbances, such as slow ingress of, of spruce, or slow amounts of regeneration that happen after uh, EFM treatments, like uh, commercial thinning. Of course, natural regeneration is different from seed and sprouting, and I put advanced regeneration here, but I'm not sure if that's actually a separate class of its own, because advanced regeneration may do nothing until it's released, and it may be released in partial rapidly, or it may just poke along in the background. So an important, another important dimension is how regeneration is integrated with other models. 
I have a couple examples here inspired by Dick Dempster's presentation and Dick showed a graphic that looked very much like this, but being less technical, techni techno savvy, or maybe just more interested in bright colors. I made my own with a pen. So the red line is the implied density trajectory for a regenerated stand of say aspen or pine from the gypsy model. It implies that the maximum density that exists in stand can be found at age zero and that density always declines. But we know that the regeneration phase of stand development involves a rapid increase in density as new trees establish that peaks somewhere and then declines. And in Alberta, we hope that peak coincides with the performance survey. So at the bottom, I've indicated that the, the idea of dividing modeling into the regeneration and the growth phases. So what Dick Dempster talked about uh, in some detail is the observation that in many stand types in Alberta, it looks like regeneration may actually peak later than the age of performance survey, like age 18. And Dick pointed out that if in reality, regeneration peaks with the blue line, but you supply an estimate of stand density to the gypsy model at age 13, gypsy is going to grow the stand as if it's following that orange line instead of the red line above. And you don't really know what that means for the accuracy of yield predictions from gypsy, but it seems likely that it's going to lead to problems with the accuracy of density projections through time. So a solution to this that, that Dick implemented in the Fripsy model was to change the handover age from age 13 to age 18. And so his model predicts density at age 18 with the expectation that this will generate more realistic projections when linked with the gypsy model. Now, a big question for mixed woods is maybe the red line is the line for, for uh, spruce that's implied by the gypsy model, or maybe it's actually the line for aspen. And the line that's given here in blue is for white spruce. Now, if you initialize the model with regeneration predictions at age 13, you're going to get a gypsy forecast of density that follows that orange line. Maybe that's a problem or maybe it's not, it depends on how it's linked to basal area volume. But what this does illustrate is that for some stand types in Alberta, there really isn't that clean break between that regeneration phase and that growth phase, that maybe they actually overlap and maybe models of regeneration and growth are going to have to operate in parallel. Another important consideration relates to the availability of suitable data. So the ideal scenario we have on the top, our model needs define our data needs. And we go out and get the data we need to construct the model we want. But in practical terms, often the available data define our data that we can use to do model development and those constrain our model capabilities. It's important to recognize that the availability of suitable data is going to impose constraints on model capabilities and that there's a trade-off between going and getting more data so that we can meet our modeling needs or working with what we have and having somewhat affected or somewhat um, altered functionality within the models. So especially since I arrived in Alberta, I spent some time thinking about potential sources of Alberta data that, we could, that could be used to develop a regeneration model. These include pre-harvest data, maybe from ABI, will give us some idea of what's going on before harvest. RSA establishment survey data gives stocking data, but only the intensive surveys actually do it on the ground. And my understanding is that only the summaries of those data are available electronically. But maybe establishment surveys could be targeted uh, to be captured electronically and useful for modeling presence. Obviously, performance survey data capture presence and abundance uh, at, the, at the ground when they're done on the ground. A lot of these data already exist and have been compiled in the post-harvest database. And of course, linkages between RSA data and regeneration modeling and silviculture are not possible without linkages to silviculture information. So that implies linkage to ERIS, and those linkages are already present in the EPH database. But they may also be present for PSP data, such as those that come from PIGI. My suspicion, the suspicion is that developing effective regeneration models is going to require repeat measurements because we need to know how regeneration is occurring beyond age 13 or a typical performance survey age. And so PIGI data may be critical for the development of a regeneration model. Plus, we have many relevant standalone research projects. If you caught uh, Phil Como's presentation a couple of days ago, 
he touched on these in some detail. Uh, I'll mention the RLP and Sundance trials because Dick Dempster used them extensively for his model, so they're not really mixed with particularly spruces of interest. But the recently completed herbicide study from FGRO has some data. Of course, the EMEND project is focused on mixed wood stands. I was fortunate to visit the Hotchkiss River mixed wood trial, and I think there's an opportunity there. There are some data from Scup and Dade, but the manipulations of regeneration there might make it difficult to make those useful. Uh, Judy Creek has some data that could be used for measuring for modeling attributes, and maybe we need to collect new data, or there's others that we just haven't found yet. So now some conclusions, some key findings and recommendations for model development. Well, my key findings are summarized here. I'm going to show you again. These models exist already. There's really a rich global history of regeneration modeling, a lot of active research and methods, diverse examples on the left there of substantial regeneration modeling efforts and some on during operational scale systems like potato and the prognosis model. And there's existing data sets in Alberta that would be suitable for modeling some or all components. I found is that most operational contexts, component models are likely superior to other approaches like imputation and um, mechanistic models, and they're the likely way to go. So my conclusion is that yes, there is an opportunity in Alberta to develop regeneration models with existing data sets. Now the terms of reference for the project had three objectives, and they, these are linked to three considerations. The three objectives, roughly speaking, were linking regeneration to yield, uh, gaming, and educating about the linkage with yield. And these have these imply three design considerations. If you're going to link regeneration to yield, you need to link to a growth and yield model. So that decision has to be made. If you're going to be gaming and educating, then design and implementation and software may be key to making models accessible to users. But Ultimately, accepting trade-offs between desired functions and available data will be essential in defining a model uh, development effort. So just a couple slides with some recommendations for next steps forward. As I mentioned already, I think there's an opportunity here. Going forward, I think a regeneration models for mixed wood stands, the model structure selected should be a component model approach, but designed to run in parallel with a larger growth in the framework because of the overlap for some species and stand types in regeneration and overstory or, or main stand development. Linkages between a regeneration model and a growth and yield model are likely going to be MGM or some other tree level model or successor to Gypsy, just because Gypsy as currently structured is going to be difficult to make run in parallel with a regeneration model. It's just not the conceptual framework for the Gypsy model. There are other tree level models like TAS, or prognosis BC that might be suitable for linking to a regeneration model at the tree level. The scope of a model development effort, however, should really be limited initially to the most common, the most important mixed wood scenarios in Alberta. And these are likely post-harvest stands as opposed to naturally disturbed stands because they're probably of greater interest to model users or FGRO members. And again, focus on core ecological regions and regeneration scenarios, this reduces it maximizes the chance of a, a big comprehensive or the bigger comprehensive data set, reducing noise and uncertainty and uh, the ability to increasing the ability to find new information that would guide future model development efforts when more data might be available or for a broader scope. So focus on what we can do well, and uh, but also consider what we might need to do next. So I've reproduced a little devil icon here up in the top that Dick Dempster used in his presentation because he said the devil's in the details. And ultimately, one of the challenges with re this review of regeneration models is, while the literature is clear in favoring component model approaches, it has little consensus on the details, how all those components are put together and how they're linked to larger comprehensive frameworks. So my recommendation is that if FGRO proceeds with a model development project, that project should make time and budget available for these five areas. Of course, the obvious one is identifying and collating existing data sets and spending a bit more time digging to find more research data sets. And Phil Como alluded to some of those in his presentation on Wednesday. Uh, make sure there's time and budget to explore and identify alternative, alternative component model structures to find the best structure to work for mixed woods that recognizes differences between regeneration strategies for some species like aspen, 
fast from suckers and spruce, slow and episodic from seed. Uh, prototype models should include formal evaluations. You should never give a mean without some estimate of variance. And you should never generate a prediction without some assessment of how much confidence it should be applied to that prediction. There needs to be a strategy developed for implementation in a linked framework. I think unlike Fripsy, it's just not possible to build a model that would plug right into Gypsy. In fact, it may not be possible to build a model that can link to Gypsy at all and might have to be done as a next step. And fi finally, uh, including appropriate documentation, including peer-reviewed publication. And I want to emphasize that I have, was unable to find any comprehensive reviews of regeneration modeling in the literature. So I think there's a great opportunity here for FGRO to increase its profile by focusing on uh, publishing the results, perhaps just of this pre-feasibility study and those of model development efforts. So with that, I'll conclude. And now I'm putting, taking off my consultant hat, that's over and uh, putting on my, uh, my uh, growth and yield chair hat. And I welcome your feedback and uh, any questions you might have. And there's my address, email address, refroze at ualberta.ca. Thank you very much.